Coming over to food for a moment, we hit processed food, emulsifiers, alcohol. Gluten is one that is really interesting in the sense that I do feel there was a population of people who were underserved by only saying avoid gluten if you have full-blown celiac. And later we learned that non-celiac gluten sensitive is actually a thing. And there are people who fit into that camp. And if they avoid gluten, they'll see improvements in their symptoms. There's a interesting sort of flavor of late, which is part of what drives NCGS might be FODMAP intolerance because gluten is high in FODMAP. So, you know, it might be antigenic, sure. And I think that's that's valid, but there also might be some people for whom it's more so a microbiome, if you want to say. It's just, you know, they, they can't metabolize the FODMAPs. What's hopeful, at least in my mind there, is if you look at the FODMAP clinical trials, there's a pretty good success rate for reintroduction after elimination. So FODMAP tolerance is something that seems to be able to be improved over time. Whereas if it's more immune, like true, I guess we would say non-celiac gluten sensitive, that might be more lifelong. Again, it hasn't been established. That's just kind of the way I think through this. But I guess zooming out, how do you think about gluten and uh, how, how prevalent of an issue do you think it is? I really appreciate you bringing this up. It so happens that with my colleagues here at Mayo Clinic, Joe Murray is a, a, a world expert on celiac disease. And so we joined forces. And uh, Maria Vasquez Roque was the fellow and now a staff member at, at Mayo Clinic in, in Jacksonville. Um, mm. She was the person who anchored the study I'm going to tell you about. So we studied mm. patients who had been given a diagnosis of diarrhea predominant irritable bowel. And we studied, in a randomized study, we looked to see whether gluten would um, any changes in, guess what, the leaky gut. Mm. And we actually showed that patients could have an increase in the permeability of their intestine if they have so-called irritable bowel syndrome. And that is how I think some of the patients, yes, the, the FODMAP story is, is legitimate. But also it is conceivable that the patients who happen to have the immunogenotype that predisposes to celiac disease, which happens to be the HLA DQ2 DQ8, what our yep. study showed was that the patients who were HLA DQ2 DQ8 and who were um, exposed to gluten were the ones that had the greatest increase in the permeability of their intestine measured mm. with our assay, which is the 13 carbon mannitol and lactulose acid. So there is the possibility that the patients who have gluten sensitivity without celiac disease may indeed have a minor form of inflammation, if you wish, right. that's caused by this increased permeability of the intestine, increased leakiness, and they may be predisposed genetically because they are carriers of those two HLA types. So I do think that in addition to the um, issue about gluten being high in the high FODMAP diet, it is also possible that there is an effect on the permeability of the intestine, on the leakiness of the intestine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. What was the prevalence, if, if you happen to know, of the people who had either symptomatic reactivity or the leaky gut or, or both? My recollection was that about 70% of the people with the immunogenotype wow. actually had evidence of increased permeability. Now, that paper is almost 10 years old, so I may have to go back and look okay. at the details again. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's high. Um, you know, the, the reason why I ask is, again, the perspective I bring is is working with people who care so much about their health. They're, they're making so many changes that sometimes you have to kind of bridle them and say, well, you know, again, I realize that you've read about salicylates, FODMAPs, selectins, you know, histamines, all these things. But- they can't all be a problem for you, right? So we kind of do an elimination, a reintroduction, try to get a sense for what elicits symptoms. And we do that against a backdrop of prevalence data. So we have a sense for, is it 70%? Is it 50%? Is it 5%? And one of the, or, you know, there's been a number of papers looking at NCGS and the ranges are kind of broad, but they're still within a camp of maybe 0.3% up to 13% is the range that I've seen. So I look at that as maybe we average NCGS at 5, 6, 7% of the population. 
Do you feel that's a fair estimation? I think that is a fair estimation. I just wanted to make to clarify. Um, Please. What I mentioned earlier was the people who were in that study with the genetic type who actually had an increase in permeability. I was not talking about symptoms. So this was, gotcha. you know, biomarker-based estimate. And, okay. and I wouldn't be so courageous to say that that applies to 70% of people, for instance, with gotcha. IBS. So yes, okay. I do appreciate that the proportion with true NCGS is probably averaging around 5%. And I'm glad you made the clarification because, you know, I think it's it's so hard for for researchers who are getting into the weeds of some of these analyses to share the information without people in the public maybe misconstruing that to, you know, Dr. Kim Larry said it was 70% of people who will get leaky gut from gluten. And it's, well, it's not necessarily what you're saying. You're sharing a finding with a, a new and novel and super interesting biomarker, but that needs to be flushed out more robustly before we can commit to a 70% prevalence. Absolutely. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah. 